All righty, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, how many of you can still talk after listening about quantum computing? <laughs> My head got exploded uh, a small bit. Um, when she asked me what I did, I was actually confused. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I said, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Not this. Wow. Um, and Jaya is what a presenter. It's like it was a breath of fresh air to hear quantum computing and actually he hear people laughing at the same time rather than, oh, no. Uh, the poor chap who was asked to multiply two numbers and then refactor it back, I, I felt really bad. Because, <laughs> you know, that reminds me of every time you go and you, you, you hear in the news or, you, you know, someone goes on the radio and they say, now, for your chance to win, do the following piece of numbers. And they're like, seven. <laughs> it, it was like that. So today I'm going to talk about reasonable security uh, practices. This is a nice and easy talk after quantum computing, which is like everything after quantum computing. And, and it's going to be about things I've learned and practices I've done at home and uh, towards my kind of uh, personal security to make myself more secure based on questions from people as I got after, after talks, how would I do X, Y, Z. And also things that I've kind of done just to ensure uh, that I don't get owned because it's it's really embarrassing when you're a security person and someone says I just broke your account. Um, it kind of does a really bad things to your brand. So this was how I do certain things, and it's also how I learned and built up a step by step rather than just going I'm now doing the best practice because it's not easy. A lot of this stuff is kind of it's changes in work style, it's changes in browsing habits, it's changes in just how you even think about when you buy something. So they, they're not for everyone. Uh, take what you want out of this and be happy with it. And if you're not doing it, don't be upset that, it, oh, I'm not as secure as X, Y, Z. It's more, if you want to be more secure, what is the next step for you? So this is a me. Um, my name is Niall. Um, this is me in my younger days before I had a full beard and looked like Santa. Um, I also have a bit of a head cold this morning. Uh, so if I sound a bit kind of lower than octaves than normal, that's it. I am the head of cybersecurity at Capgemini. And I'm a Microsoft Regional Director, which is one of 160 in the world who act as advisors. Um, I'm an MVP from the technical side. And catch me on Twitter. It's the most place I'm most active. Um, I'm also at capgemini.com. And then you can do these things. So the state of security for most people is this. Um, we look at things and they think, OK, how are we think we're secure, but we're not really, because we've put a Band-Aid over it. And most of us are kind of, yeah. We're happy enough, OK? Uh, the, the general consensus is most people in Norway think they're quite secure. Uh, if you ask other people, you'd say no. And I got asked, I was at, a, I was at a, a meeting yesterday with a client, and they said, are you happy enough in, this, in the security report you've delivered to us? And I said, I'm happy in what I've tested. I'm terrified about what I haven't. And they're going, what does that mean? I says, Mostly, I can tell you, I'm confident what I've written down and I've tested is good, but the stuff I haven't tested is what terrifies me because I don't know what I'm missing. And they go, that's a really odd thing to say. And I said, no, it's a clarification. It's just making sure that I couldn't have tested absolutely everything because there's not enough time in the world. You know, if you want to test absolutely everything, it's not going to work. So I generally kind of suggest that like, when we look at different security methods and whatever, we will accept that bad things happen to good people. OK? Now, I. I I, 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 yeah, every time I put up Trump, I have to put up a little dog afterwards because it makes me feel a lot better. OK. Um, I, I'm stolen a slide from one of my uh, uh, friends here, uh, Stephen Hans, and saying hope is not a strategy when it comes to security. OK. Hope, you hope it's secure is not a good enough defense if something goes wrong. OK. Hope is not a strategy for defining out a security posture for yourself. I hope I am OK. I hope they'll be fine. How many of you have got kids? I always like this because I've got kids and they're great. And they're mad little security testers. Um, do you know that kids are rules lawyers? You know what a rules lawyer is? A rules lawyer is when you give them a rule, they will find a way around it. Now, kids are fantastic for this because if you say, for example, Magnus, you're not allowed to take your kick bike down the middle of the street anymore. Now, this is a rule. I've told my son. Magnus, Ishelov, Harsbach is Hickel, right in the middle of the van. He's like, okay, Papa, egg for Stolen. It's like, great, it's good for you. Come out five minutes later, there he is in the middle of the fucking street with a kick bike. 
And I says, Magnus, what did I just say? He says, well, it's not my kick bike. <laughs> I was sitting there going, I, I went back into my wife. And I goes, I'm done. I'm done. She goes, what's wrong? He says, he just lawyered me and I just don't know what to do. I just sit here and be quiet. <laughs> he said, what did he do? He said this. And he says, a clever little bastard. <laughs> But that's what kids do, and that's what uh, security people do, and that's what attackers will do. Just because you said you couldn't do it, they said, well, you didn't say I couldn't do it this way. And that's what we always try. And so with security and things that we've tried to attempt and try and make, we sometimes have to go back to basics a little bit and think about how do we, as people, understand risks and threats? How do you understand something is a threat? Just simply ask yourself, how do you understand when that you can see something go, that's a problem, that's a threat? Okay? How do you know that? Just, and uh, this is an open question now, it's an actual trying to engage the audience a bit here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even after seeing the failure uh, on stage. How? Is it something that it? You're a gentleman, well done, got it in one. Awesome. Yes, because you've experienced it. Exactly. Experience tells us something is a threat. Because if we haven't seen it before, we don't honestly know it's a threat. Think about the number of times you've seen, for example, kids run across the road, and your superhuman reflex is kicking you, just grab them and pull them back, because you see a car there, or you know that they're going to just, you, you know when you go out onto the road, you're meant to look both sides. Kids are, I don't know what's going on. Blech. Okay? So I always try and put up this kind of nice video for explaining about um, experience and threats and risks. What can go wrong if you give a seven-year-old a samurai sword? Okay, what's gonna happen? Yeah! Right. Now, now, <laughs> this for me, what would you think the learning experience from this is? <laughs> what do you think the learning experience from this is? The learning experience, strange enough, is Move the block further away from the pool next time, okay? Check the distance. You know that the kid is going to get out the sword and be like, so we'll swing here, we'll be over here. Whoosh. Yeah, we're good. Okay, because they're going to do it again, because, you know, they've got a sword. Who, who's not going to have a sword and do that? But, of course, this type of thing happens, because as soon as you put this up, most people go, ah, yes, something bad's going to happen because I've experienced. And experience teaches us a massive amount of things. It teaches us and it, we learn from it because every single screw up you've ever made becomes a tool that you can use next time to say not do this again. Like if you look at very experienced IT people, all right, something goes wrong and they go, oh yeah, I did that before and they just do it. And it's that I, I, I think one of uh, my friends, Glenn Hendrickson, was, he said he was, he was complimented in the weirdest way. He, must, he was said, you must be the greatest screw up in IT I've ever met. And the guy goes, what? And he goes, you have an answer for everything. You must have broken. And he goes, eh, yeah, I kind of have, yeah. And when we start off, we're very naive, and we start off with little things, and we go, I don't think this will work, or I, I, it'll be fine, and then you screw up. And you, you learn the concept of an uh-oh second. Everyone knows what an uh-oh second is? An elastic unit of time? It's that, that moment in life where something goes wrong, and you go, uh-oh. All right? And time stops. And you get that moment of clarity. You know you've screwed up. You know it's bad. It's usually like, for example, when I was, uh, I always remember my first major uh oh second uh, was where I was working on a SQL Server database. And I, in, instead of, uh, I was doing a kind of a, an update to something. I did update table set value equal to one. Enter. F5. Uh-oh. Did you put in the where clause? <laughs> nah, -uh. nah, -uh. no shits. <laughs> back to the database backups. Database backups are how many years old? Uh, so that was my uh-oh second. I always remember it, and it, it has stuck with me ever since that I write a select query first that writes out what I expect to update, and then I just change it to an update afterwards. That's what I do. It's my... It's my feature, and I, I teach people this every time you say, 
I, I, when I teach people how to do SQL stuff, and they say, OK, so what's the best way to do this? I said, first off, turn auto commit off. It's on by default. And they're like, huh? And I said, why would you do that? And I said, it's a fail safe. Because when you screw something up, it doesn't, it's like, oh, OK, great. And then you, you can spot then as they come back, dude, I'm so glad you, you did that, showed me that, because man, I nearly, ah. you know? So experience tells us a lot of things. So I'm going to start with the kind of the first one, the security practices and things like that. And we're going to go into the one that makes the most sense for most people, which is passwords. OK? <coughs> Excuse me. Passwords are, we have them all, OK? As in, I have all yours. Um, who, like, let's start with a very obvious question. How many of you use the same password for more than one service? And that's a really good, honest answer. Thank you. There's never been an empty audience that said that. Um, and it's, it's normal. And why would you use the same password for more than one service? Remembering. Thank you. Exactly. And it's, it's, not, it's not an ashamed thing, but it's, it's just a very kind of passwords are, are meant to be hard to remember, right? Or hard, sorry, hard to forget. But the, the idea is that if you have a complex password, having more than one becomes difficult. Like, I honestly kind of uh, I've told people that this is a, a normal problem. But like, the thing is that when we look at what our social media and all our different connected services look like, it's like this. And if I compromise one, I can potentially compromise everything. This is a huge way of our life. And this is also something where we can use, like, for example, something like open source intelligence. Now, open source intelligence is the use of intelligence gathering techniques to find information in, disconnect, in disconnected systems to build a bigger picture about you. So if I'm looking, for example, something about Torstein here, I could go on to Facebook, and I would find out, OK, how would you find out someone's birth date? You go onto Facebook, right? You see, crash the Amadog, crash the Amadog, crash the Amadog. OK, great. Even if you're not friends with them, they might be public and a lot of stuff there. And how do you find out what year they're born if you can't see that? Someone's going to be, grass lerma or, you know, grass lerma dagen, you know, it's like these things. And you just work out backwards and forwards where they should be. OK, how would you find someone's phone number in Norway? Gula Sida, perfect, thank you. Uh, so we've got two pieces of information. We've got your birth date and your phone number. What two of those pieces of information are used normally for? Password resets. Password resets, banky day. How would you potentially find someone's email address? Google it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or you could go on to a website and just hopefully type in something and see if it resets correctly and whatever. Um, so with all this type of information together, you could potentially, and then you can go and find a password breach, and you could say, well, this is the password they're using. Try and get into one of these services, start resetting, and all of a sudden you do an account takeover or you start taking over accounts and things like that. So this is a very common thing that you can, and the worst thing is, I don't even have to do this manually anymore. There's tooling that'll just say, so, uh, select victim, here you go. Here's all the different social media platforms they're on. Here's their usernames, here's their passwords, potentially they could be using for. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, you saw, like the, you, can, you can get these type of like just password hashings, uh, or sorry, you can do brute force passwords, you can do uh, password stuffing, and you could then potentially just say, OK, here's just an account belonging to this person. OK? Begin to take over, do something with it. Because w as hackers, we think in graphs. We don't have to go A, B, C to get you. We might go a little bit around the houses to try and find out this particular person and, it's, and go after their, uh, their credentials. For example, let's look at Joan here, our CEO. All right? If I wanted to kind of get access to Joan, what I could do is I could start with maybe the PA. Let's talk to Peter, the PA, and ask the question of, hi, I'm looking for Joan. And, OK, Joan is in Brazil at a conference. Great. So now I know one piece of information. Joan is in Brazil. So I can then go and talk to the next person, say John in accounts. Hi, um, I'm Niall from Capgemini. Listen, uh, Joan's in Brazil, um, and she's asked me to take care of this. Can you submit a form here for me and just pay this into one of our accounts because you're due now, and if you don't, Joan's going to get really upset. OK? Simple informational tactics to get because I've generated some trust with you, and then I'm just going to use this back and forth. Now, it's nothing related to passwords, but the idea of being able to get someone's password off them could be the thing of the idea, hi, I'm Niall from Capgemini Security. I'm working with Joan here in Brazil. And listen, she's, having, she's on stage. She's having a major problem. She needs a password reset. Can I get her new password for you? 
and all they're hearing is someone trying to help and their boss in trouble, that I could potentially steal a password. And people have done this, and it's very simple because we're just relying on good nature. And here is a list of the most common passwords you'll find in the wild, believe it or not, okay? It's really odd, but these are the most common passwords you'll see. Uh, like, I like the one, change me, always, it's nice. Uh, these passwords uh, exist everywhere. Uh, people use them, and if you, and really weird thing is that if you go looking for um, open devices, most likely, if you tried some of these, like guest and guest, admin, admin, administrator, admin, administrator, password, you'll find your way into most systems. Because default passwords are a common problem. Because people ship with easy to, easy, to, easy to remember, but then how many people change the default passwords? How many of you have changed the default passwords on a system? Excellent. How many of you haven't? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know for a fact there is at least one device in my home network that is still running on a default password. And I just, there's a point of me, I'm leaving it there to see what happens, okay? Because I maybe just like a little bit of pain, I'm looking for some, uh, maybe some stuff. But I'm not, I'm not gonna be so dishonest and say like, I oh, know I've done everything right. I've done it because I just, I know, I'll, I'll get to it when I have time. And I'll probably go home and I'll change it because I just wanna do it now. Having the same key for, the mul for one lock leaves you in a very difficult position. What happens if we steal one of the keys? We have access to your lock. And if your lock, if you have only one key, or if you, to one lock, that's fine. Because if that's the case, great. But if you have multiple keys, then accessing, you don't know who's gonna access your data and your accounts. So this is why we should have, for example, multiple passwords for mu and multiple accounts. I, this is a very difficult thing for most people not in the IT community to grasp. So it's not designed for an IT community audience. This is more, why would you need multiple passwords? Because I know if my password's strong enough, and I'm saying this is the problem, if you, have, if you lose one key, it's like lose, having the same key to your house, to your car, and to something else. And my dad said, that would be a fantastic idea. <laughs> and at that point, I went, oh, usability-wise, it'd be awesome. And I said, okay, let me put it in a different way. Do you know any phone numbers? And he goes, I know your mother's. I said, do you know mine? He goes, no. But I said, you ring me nearly every week. And he goes, yeah, because I just opened my phone, I clicked Nile, and, it, and you ring. And I was like, yeah, but what happens if you lose your phone? And I says, oh, I'd be screwed. <laughs> I said, I know, but the thing is, what was the simplicity factor? He says, I just save your number once, and I don't have to remember it ever again. I said, what if you had to do that with passwords? And he goes, is there a way of doing that too? <laughs> I said, my man, there is. But a little bit of a basic security hygiene, you too can have a password manager. And so I introduced him to a password manager, and LastPass. And what was really cool about this was he could share some of my passwords without having to know what they were. He just knew that he could get access to certain things that I had set up for him. Now, my dad recently transitioned um, into the consulting life after working 45 years with a single company, okay? which meant that he's now doing freelance work for companies, and so I set him up in an office, uh, ProPlus, on Office 365, custom domain, the whole thing all set up for him and everything done. I manage the backend stuff for him, okay, and I take care of everything, and all I do is I update his password in LastPass. He then opens his phone, it goes, you need to update your password, and he goes, okay. He looks at his phone, his phone goes, your password's been updated, goodbye. And he's there, this is amazing. I don't know my password. It says, you cannot be, I said, I'm not going to say you cannot be hacked, but the thing is, everything this way works well. And he's like, this is great. It's just another example here. Is I just like, I, my brother asked, could he borrow my Spotify account? Because he was going to France cycling. And he goes, as you can see, here's the thing. What was the first text? The password. Are you serious? I said, yep. He goes, it's only used for Spotify. And he just, his next thing was, uh, was Anonymous trying to hack you? And I says, it wasn't, not with this freaking password. And, and he goes, and there's further on, he says, what do I do with this? And he goes, type it in very carefully. One cool feature if you have very complex passwords. How many of you use Netflix? Excellent. How many of you share your Netflix account with someone else? Yep. How many of you wish you didn't have to? Yep. <laughs> Give them a complex password like this. 
have you tried to type this in on a remote control on a TV? <laughs> Honestly, what could happen is the person goes, ah, screw this, I'll just pay to get it because I got it wrong. Um, and you just say, I might change it every week. <laughs> Damn it. Because with a password manager, you can do this. You can rotate passwords without having to worry. For example, LastPass. I can change my Amazon account on a weekly automatic basis, and I don't have to worry about it. It just does it. I, do, I change my account passwords about once every three months on average, and I just go in and I just go automatically update, and it, just goes, and it goes done. It goes into the UI, it automatically runs the script, changes my password, does the update, resets it, updates my new password, and I'm like, I'm done. I don't know what it is. My Spotify account is 80 characters long. My Gmail account is 100. My bank ID is 100. Because you know you can have a long bank ID. It's a uh, bank ID password. It's fantastic. Because the idea of someone actually having access to my bank is terrifying. But you can do this. Now, the next level after this is not just having one single account, but having multiple accounts. OK? And this is another level of ab abstraction for people. This is where people start getting a bit kind of, huh? Do you know you can have multiple email addresses? I know, it's new, isn't it? Do you remember a day when you used to have to pay for email? Anyone, anyone old enough to remember that? Yeah. Before, um, uh, does anyone remember when Gmail introduced, was Gmail was introduced? April 1st, 2005, wasn't it? And everyone thought it was a joke. One gigabyte free email, what are they doing? And they changed the world. But you can have multiple um, faces. You can have multiple things. So for example, I use a, t a thing called Blur. And Blur, what it allows me to do is create accounts with the opaque.com address. So it's a like random string at opaque.com. And opaque is, means you can kind of see through it. This is kind of interesting. And it forwards automatically to my private email address if I wanted to. So this is really handy where I have to sign up for something and I don't want to give them my address because I don't want the spam. So this is also a, uh, a plugin on Chrome, which means it says create new account here, and it will just create a new email address for me. I will then be able to use that email address, and I will then create a new password for it, which LastPass will store, which means that my email address is never associated to that particular website. It also means that if I get a lot of spam from it, I just turn it off, and it just goes to a dead box. This works extremely well um, for me because the fact is then I don't have my uh, email address popping up everywhere. But it just also means that if something gets, this is only for throwaway accounts. If I don't really care, and so like for example, one of the places I used this before was um, I needed to download the MySQL Workbench to open a MySQL um, uh, backup. And I had logged, I logged, created the account the first time around, and I came back and it says, you last logged in here 417 days ago using this account. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I don't have to sign up again. Automatically done. It just works really, really well. It allows you a small bit of isolation away from uh, getting owned or getting kind of, uh, it's for privacy, for example, if, you don't wanna have, if you're on a site that you really don't want to, uh, kind of your personal mail attached to. There are certain like, uh, kind of nefarious underworld sites that may not, uh, you don't want to be seeing your kind of private email address popping up in a breach or something. But also, you might not just want to kind of have all that kind of rubbish going to your private account either. And instead of having all this done, I just have a nice, simple, and as you can see here, I can turn on and off uh, the different things. And I can delete them if they're done, so the email address disappears, and it's never used again. So this is really handy. It's also free. LastPass, I think, cost me about, I think, $10 a year. Um, another, uh, sorry, just another advantage of uh, using kind of a password manager. One of the things is we are mortal, correct? We live and we die. The problem with security people is when we create very secure things, other people don't understand. What happens if you die and someone needs access to your passwords, like your loved one, to get access to, for example, your Dropbox account where you have all the kids' photos stored? or the crash plan where you have all the backups stored. How do people get access to that? When you have a complex password that only you knew. You don't. There is alternatives. We create things like digital wills. So in my case, 
I have within LastPass a emergency access feature. And this works really well. What I can do is my wife can email a specific account. And if I don't answer or don't click the link, so she requests access to my LastPass account. If I don't click the link within seven days, it automatically opens LastPass for her. So she gets access to all the passwords and account details she needs to, for example, get access to my Twitter account, get access to Facebook, get access to anything like, for example, because my home network password is 100 characters long. OK? Like for, no, sorry, not home network, not the Wi-Fi password, but for example, the, uh, to access certain accounts and whatever on the NASAs and whatever, all those sharing accounts, they're all really long passwords and complex. So she needs to access my home computer or like my desktop. It's not exactly like, you know, she can go in and type in password. It's using Face ID or like uh, Windows Hello. So this is a digital will. And this is just another thing that if you're going to create a very complex security solution, also have a way that allows other people to get in just in case you need to. Not a backdoor per se, but just a kind of an, an, an unlock feature that comes along. One thing I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit, which is kind of not new, but it's kind of coming along a bit more, is a thing called business email compromise. And this is where we use compromised passwords to log into someone's email. Um, unfortunately, this is more and more common because stealing passwords is pff, great, but there's no real monetary value of stealing someone's Spotify account. However, if you were to compromise someone's Office 365 account, what could you do? You could connect their email, watch the emails back and flow for, uh, forward, and then inject yourself in the conversation. So, a common thing what's being used right now is, for example, someone's employee email is, in, is compromised, and you go, dear HR, payroll, um, whatever, um, I've changed banks. Can you change my new payment account details to the following? And here's my new account number. Okay? Come the 20th of the month, you go, pay, day, what? Where's my pay? You email HR, and HR go, we paid you. And they go, well, you didn't. I could look, here's my bank account. Oh, no, you changed your bank account three days ago. No, I didn't. Well, you emailed and said you did. This is a very common thing to do. Now, that's a small amount of money in comparison to what they're actually doing. So if you look at places where, for example, the likes of in the US, where transactions and the sales of houses, people are changing the destination bank account where the people are supposed to pay the money into. You can't do that very easily in Norway, but you can do that anywhere else. Currently, Norway is defended against this by only one thing. Want to guess what it is? You speak Norwegian. How many of you seen or have seen Google Translated Norwegian? Yeah, everyone laughs. How many of you can spot it? Even I can spot it. <laughs> okay? But this is just an example of where this injection technique is becoming more and more comp. 27 billion, they estimate, per year and growing. Okay? And the thing is, it is bloody invisible because you can add an email. If you crack an administrator's password, you can add an exchange rule that can change PDFs on the, on the outfly. So that, for example, certain things like transfers and invoices will gotten. My cousin, who works, uh, he owns his own, uh, uh, what does he do? He is a builder in London. He, he rings me, he's in a panic. He says, I've just lost 100 grand, 1 million knock. I said, what happened? Someone changed an invoice and changed it, and we've got it was sent to the Ukraine. I was like, geez, what happened? He goes, and it turns out, I said, okay, you need to go here, here, here. And they said, Christ, there's a rule here. And he didn't, like, he did, he didn't know what he was looking at. He says, okay, who's your administrator? And he says, oh, it's this guy. What, did, did he have 2FA on his accounts? He goes, 2F what? And I went, no. I said, I said okay, 2FA is the single best protection for your accounts right now. Or sorry, it is partly the single best protection, if that can be done. Who doesn't have 2FA on their accounts right now? Awesome. No? Oh, two. Well, okay. We'll, we can show you how to do it afterwards. It's okay. Um, 2FA. So two-factor authentication, having something where you have to do something else, like you get an SMS, not good, get a Google Authenticator prompt, whatever, et cetera. These are, by default, should be turned on. If you don't have it, you're putting yourself at risk. 99.9% .9 of most attacks, password stuffing, can be stopped with 2FA. Because as soon as your password is cracked, 
The second part kicks in and you get a text message and you automatically know someone's up to doing something funny and you can go, uh-oh, right? 2FA, better is MFA. Something you have, something you are, and something you know, okay? So these, when you have multi-factor authentication, means that they would have to have all three parts of you. So they'd have to chop off your finger, know your password, and get access to your phone, okay? These is a very strong thing for people to do. I have this, it's starting to come in more and more. You'll start seeing Windows Hello, and for example, uh, Face uh, ID on uh, iOS, for example, allowing you to, uh, using Web, web Authn, to be able to kind of basically authenticate and use passwords against your uh, machine by just looking at it. Much better, but the idea that you would have, that you should be make it as seamless as possible. So for example, when I log in to um, Azure, for example, it prompts me, it says, you need to press the button here on your, uh, so it just pops up here and I go, bink, and it does that, so I can log in. So it's approve the login. If you're not using 2FA on Twitter, Google, Facebook, or any of these other things, you, are, you should do it right now. Because this will stop a lot of things. Account takeovers are much more uh, permissive right now, and this is going to cause more problems for you. Because the, the thing is, we can use phishing techniques to get this information out of you, OK? And phishing is one of those things that causes us a lot of hassle. Because when we talk about reasonable security practices, one of the things I have to tell people about is how to learn to be a bit more aware and a little bit more skeptical about stuff. Because the general thing with phishing is we start off with the idea of trawling. Trawling is where we just send out an email and we hope we're going to get something to happen. But more likely, we're going to use things like spear phishing. Spear phishing is a generation where we have knowledge belonging to you, okay, that, we, that generates a certain amount of trust with you to, we, to assert ourselves as being legit. So how many of you have been rang by Microsoft lately? I got rang at 20 past eight on Saturday morning. And now, Niall at 20 past eight is an okay person. Niall at 20 past eight on a Saturday morning, not so okay. Niall at 20 past eight on a Saturday morning with a flu is the demon. Hello, this is Jeff from, my, from Microsoft. Hi, Jeff. I'm Niall. I'm the director of cybersecurity. Bee! <laughs> it's like, thank you, Jeff. Good night. I did have a very good fun one with uh, poor old, I'll tell you about him in a minute. Anyway, spear phishing is a, comp, is a very simple way of getting information out of you by generating a small We talked about how we get access to Joan, for example, by Joan asking questions. The simple thing is that what we're trying to introduce to you is a mistake, okay? Everyone has an inner Dave, and Dave is a bastard, okay? Dave is human error. When we put you in what is known as a hot state, you are going to do one of two things. You're going to do fight or flight, okay? A hot state is where we put you in a position where you're going, I don't know what to do, and your body then goes, find a solution and get out of this as quick as possible, okay? Most people understand a hot state as when they're asked a question they're uncomfortable with, and they're just doing whatever it takes to get out of it, okay? Think about like, for example, when Jaya was like, she goes to me, what do you do? And I went, I don't know, <laughs> okay? That was me in a hot state. This happened to me with, for example, the concept of we have sexploitation uh, email, email uh, phishing. Sexploitation is where we, <coughs> excuse me, where someone will send you an email saying, Dear Niall, I am a hacker, okay? And I have hacked your computer and your webcam. And to prove I'm a hacker, here is your phone number and your password, okay? So, all right, continues on. We've noticed you've been on adult sites, and we've recorded your, you on these adult sites, both your screen and your video, while you've been on it. And, to prove, and if you do not send us two bitcoins, we will distribute this to all your friends on Facebook, okay? So I'm sitting there Saturday morning, Sunday morning, having a cup of coffee, reading the newspaper, and this email pops up. I'm like, oh, oh. I know this is a scam. I know this is a scam because I've, I've read about this and I've examined it before. My face still went red. My body went, huh? Because I saw the password and I saw the phone number and I said, gee, oh, they have a lot of information on me. And I'm like, uh, 
And my body, and my body's like doing this, and it's like getting a bit shaky, and then, and then my brain goes, Niall, I got this. And I said, go, brain, go. And it goes, number one, they can get your, e your phone number from Google. So he does it. Number two, that's an old password you haven't used in 15 years. Number three, you don't have a webcam. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a webcam, but it was unplugged at the time. But the, the idea here is that I, I knew this was a scam, and I still got that shock. Now, my neighbor, um, God bless her, she's a lovely woman, she rings me in absolute panic and says, I've been hacked, someone's ra stole my webcam and they've been watching me. And the thing is, I said, it's a, it's a fake. She goes, no, 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 it's real, it's real, it's real. I'm like, I can ask you a very, very important question, please answer it honestly. And they go, yeah, were you on any, any adult websites? And she goes, no, then you're good. Because <laughs> they went, Oh, yeah, that's what they did say. I did ring the police, though, and I, and I said, oh, fair play to you, well done. I said, they don't need the hassle, but to be honest, this is a fake. And let me explain why, and I explained how this is. But she, it was very hard for her to understand, okay? Now, the thing is this, is, this is what they're trying to do. They're putting you in a position. They're getting information and generating trust because they have information that they want. Now, of course, if she had a different password for every site, this would have been, and of course, like me, where if, they, if I can read my password, I know it's not legit, okay? They would have had this. So I'm going to put a test up in front of you. Which one of them is the legit iCloud? So, this one? Hands up. Okay. This one? So, and those who just don't care. <laughs> All the audience. Well, the big reveal. Ta-da! No fake ones on the side. Um, so you can see here, it's really awkward. And this is, so you know when they show you these phishing sites and they're on big screens and you can spot it straight away that the URL is wrong? Okay? The thing behind this is that this is what happened with, the, for example, the... Uh, the 2014 Apple iCloud leak, it was both fake passwords, phishing, whatever. This is, this is why Apple had to really increase their overall security, and you get now logins and all this type of stuff. But this very simple view is to show you, <coughs> without seeing the top, you can't understand, you don't know which one is which. So a lot of us may not even look at the browser bar. And, the, and you know, at Apple and all the rest have taken away the visual indicators. Okay? So... This, is, this just shows straight up, like, I'm not saying that these should have visual indicators, I'm just saying that you have to start keep being very aware of what you're looking at. And this is a very common problem because people don't understand this, and then they get, well, I thought I logged into the correct account, it looked legit, it was fine. But for us who are devs and techs and whatever, this is normal, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe see this. But if I catch you in the right time frame, and I show you what is supposed to be, what you think is supposed to be there, and you think it's right, you think it's legit, and all of a sudden, bugger, uh-oh. You know you've done something wrong. Because we can send SMSs with this type of information, okay? And this is a very quick way of doing things, because an email is in very kind of, for example, is very impersonal. An SMS is more personal. Like how many of you answer, like look at the phone, oh, it's an SMS, and then you realize it's IKEA family. Okay, <laughs> damn it, they're the only people who text me, all right? And we can send SMSs very quickly. And then this is how we would get around two-factor authentication, for example, using SMS. We just tell you we're going to attack you. We have your password. We then we say, listen, we just noticed a sign-in address from this place. If you would like to lock your account temporarily, please reply to the alert with a six-digit verification code you will receive momentarily. Isn't that awesome? Hi, we just hacked your account. Can we have your code? <laughs> OK, thanks. You know, and it's like it takes two seconds to set this up using, like, for example, Atomic SMS. So I'm going to go back to my Apple guys, because I assume this is how they dress. Or not my Apple guys, my Microsoft guys. I assume this is how they dress, uh, because, you know, they are bandits. I get rang, on average, uh, about three times a week from Microsoft, OK? And I, I feel lucky. But they're, now I'm seeing they're being very fucking sneaky. They're getting four seven numbers. There's Norwegian numbers now. Before, it used to be like some random country in the world, but now it's Norway, right? Um, I usually give up after about four seconds. My wife likes to play with her food. 
She comes home. She's so proud. She comes home. She goes, no, you never guessed what I just did. I was like, uh, parked the car? <laughs> and she goes, not that. I said, what did you do? And she goes, I had a Microsoft caller. And I went, oh, what did you do? What did you do? And she goes, first thing I did was I said, I'm sorry, I'm not near my computer. Can you ring me back in 10 minutes? <laughs> okay? It's like, go on. <laughs> this is like, it's getting really good. And she goes, and then, so I had my wireless headphones on. And I'm saying, oh, no, my computer's powering down. Can you ring me back now? I'm just going to get, can you ring me back in 10 minutes again? And she goes, yeah, no problem, no problem. I'm in the car. I can't do it. Can you ring me back in 10 minutes? <laughs> I, I, it's just, that was five minutes ago. Do you want to see what happens when they ring again? It's like, go. So the phone comes on. It's in full speakerphone. And she goes, yeah. So uh, what do I need to do? You need to press the power on button. Done that. And the, she purposely, all that comes up is the Mac sound. And, I, and your man goes, madam, do you have a Mac? And she goes, yeah. Ding. <laughs> I turn around to her and I goes, this is why I married you. <laughs> She's like, you may be the hacker, but I'm the pro. <laughs> I honestly, she was brilliant. And, I, like, and she go, I said, why do you do this? She goes, well, it maybe deflects from someone else getting done. I was like, so like my, my poor, her poor <coughs> grandmother, she gets rang quite often and she can't understand why. And I said, well, to be honest, your number ends with 0001. So most likely you're number one on the dialing list that they have. And uh, she goes, well, what's wrong with my computer? I said, nothing is wrong with your computer. I've set it up. If they ring, tell them, send, send them to ring me instead. I said, just simple, just tell them to ring me. And like my, so my uncle is a priest, okay? A man of God. He's not very good with science, but he's a man of God. I set up his computer, okay? He was rang by Microsoft and he paid the 300 bucks for this. And I said, Fada, what did you do that for? And he goes, because they, they sounded nice. <laughs> I went, yeah. I said, I, I, listen, I need to wipe that machine and I get you up and running. And uh, unfortunately, it was an expensive lesson for him, but that, that's what it was. So I like to put up the quote that says, very simply, don't believe everything you read on the internet, but just because there's a picture quote beside it, Abraham Lincoln. Because unfortunately, we have this thing that people, when they get rang, assume it's legit and it's not. So this is a problem. So when it comes to this, the security practices, be a bit more aware here. Now I'm going to flick over to Wi-Fi. This is one of my kind of things that I like to kind of show off where I have spent a bit of time trying to figure out to do how to do it better for myself. Um, you've all probably seen the Wi-Fi pineapple where uh, we can do the SSID and faking. Um, one of the things I, uh, I'd like to show you is like what happens when you get in the man in the middle of someone's Wi-Fi. So the demo here is that we're going to take over someone's uh, Google account. Okay. So this would be an example of when uh, uh, we just want to do an, uh, uh, some ARP spoofing. So here you can see there is, if I do an ARP minus A on Windows, I can see that I have my network address has ends in uh, C9 and my uh, gateway, or sorry, my Kali box ends in D2. Okay, so far so good. So these are MAC addresses, these translate uh, where the IP address translates to an actual network card. Okay, so if you put this IP address on, and you can, if, you can target individual Mac, uh, ARP tables on different computers. So what I'm going to do is run a commit, command here, which will do some uh, ARP poisoning. And this is fairly invisible, because uh, Windows doesn't even tell you something, is, an ARP update has happened. So I'm going to do here ARP minus A. It's nothing going to show you in a minute. But you notice the gateway's gone offline. OK, if we try it again. All of a sudden, my gateway and my Kali box have this uh, same MAC address which means that now all, if you're going to send a dot .2, it's going to go to my, uh, my Kali box and route it through you before it heads onto the internet. So I'm just going to bring up, uh, for example, here in, uh, and try and type into Google. Okay? So this is, it was done back in about 2017, 2018. So just to google.com. So it's legit. You can see Google traffic. Everything looks nice until you look at the, task, until you look at the uh, menu bar. And you see it says www. That's because I've changed the DNS. I know it's over HTTP. How many of you would ever see Google over HTTP um, in any other country other than the Saudis? Anyway, um, this is just an example here. And then the thing is, if I type in my, uh, this is legit traffic as well. You can see up here now it says account over HTTP as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I go up here again, I type in, for example, Nile. And I type in password. Come on, type in the password. 
and I should be able to show you what the password looks like. If I click sign in, okay? Nothing happened, okay? But if I go back here, I see password 1234 is actually being passed up and, and I can capture your password. I could do this by just sitting in the same network as you, all right? So to deflect against this, you would have a VPN. So how many of you are actually on the Wi-Fi here? How many of you think you're on the Wi-Fi here? <laughs> how many of you just went, oh, shit? No, I'm not running anything. I'm not spoofing anything for once, thank God. Um, normally what happens is when I go into a uh, network like this, I will run first thing called Wi-Fi Man, and I'll see what type of devices I can see. Are they doing network segregation or are they not? And generally I'll see all the different devices coming up, and you'll see, like, for example, John's MacBook, Niall's uh, iPhone, this thing, that, 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 and I'll find whoever is running whatever device they're running on locally. So I can see it, okay? If I run a VPN, automatically, I'm going to be off, off that. And of course, my internet access is going to be um, uh, hidden from everywhere else. So I, if people ask me which one I use, I use Freedom. And I use this on iOS, for example. And it's literally just a button. On, off. No complicated stuff to be done. OK? Five devices for about 40 bucks. If you're, if you're traveling a lot, if you're doing on, on open networks and whatever, a VPN is by default. Now, the thing is, the reason I recommend this even for my dad when he's traveling, I recommend it for everyone. And the way I sold this to my dad, simply enough, was he could watch uh, home TV on his mobile wherever he was in the world. Okay? I didn't tell him the security features. Okay? I just told him the other things. Now, the, this is just a good way of kind of, uh, of learning how to do this stuff. And this is also uh, something that it, it's important to understand that not all networks are legit. So when we talk about our home networks, like for example, even, uh, I've just moved house, and I do have three floors now, so I actually had to put in three different access points. Um, I said I did, my wife said I didn't, um, but I have the whole thing of, I want my network and my Wi-Fi to be just, it works everywhere. So I have bought a Unify or by Ubiquity. So if you haven't seen, this is actually quite uh, good gear. It's, I'm not telling you to buy this, I'm just saying that this is the one I've been using. And uh, what I've done, for example, here is I put in different access points and it separates out. I don't have one single router with like a firewall or whatever. I have a separate switch, I have a separate router, I have a separate firewall. And then I have separate access points in the different levels of the house. Okay, this works. It's, it's expensive as hell. And the only reason I got away with this, okay, for the men in the audience, my wife complained that the Wi-Fi wasn't good enough where she was sitting, where she liked to sit on the couch, okay? And I said, this is a problem I can fix. And she says, go fix it. And I went, are you sure? <laughs> and now my wife knows exactly how to play me, okay? I was played like a fiddle. She goes, fix it in any way you can. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> Two weeks later, she goes, Jesus, the Wi-Fi is awesome here. And she goes, what's this cost? And she says, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but she's never complained about it since. And the kids, well, the thing is, the kids have always complained about the Wi-Fi everywhere else now. That's the only thing. But the thing is here is that we've been using it. And I have, for example, I have a Wi-Fi network set up like this. I can see, for example, all the different devices and their traffic up and down. So it gives you an idea of what's going on. And I can see where they're connected to. And then I've also created user groups which allow me, for example, our default one, which is our local one, our guests have unlimited, but for example, when I, when I've, um, when I need to rebalance them, I can, for example, uh, give 50 megabyte, 50 megabyte bandwidth to the kids, or I can give whatever, and I can change these up and down, so if I want to have limited bandwidth for different devices. As you notice here, my IoT, my IoT network has five megs. So anything that I don't trust, Internet of Things, I, I have very little connected smart devices, actually, to be honest. Anything I don't trust sits on the IoT network. OK? That's it. It doesn't have any access to any of the other devices. They just sit in there. So that user group has its own, and that user group and that old Wi-Fi has its own grouping. I, how many of you have a guest network on your network? How many of you use it actively for guests? How many, let's put it a different way. How many of you give your local Wi-Fi password to your guests? Yep. Why? Why would you do such a thing? So even my, my dad got very upset at this, by the way. He found this, he found it, why am I on the guest network, Niall, and not on the, the, the live one? <laughs> and my mother was going, Tony, don't push it. <laughs> I said, you're on the guest network because I don't trust your device. And he goes, why don't you trust my device? Because you're using it. <laughs> I said, I don't know what's on it. 
<coughs> Excuse me. And I don't, want to, I don't want you to have to feel like you're going to have the same security policies that my stuff has. And he goes, what do you mean? I says, all my network stuff is monitored. And he goes, really? And I was like, yes. But I said, on the guest network, I have just logs that just disappear after an hour. The other stuff I can keep, and I've, they're going into an actual, into a uh, CM. And he goes, oh, all right. And I says, okay. So I also have a pie hole. Anyone not using a pie hole at the moment? Anyone don't know what a pie hole is? Oh, good. Pie hole is a DNS resolver and, and also a nice URL filter thingy. Um, what it does is it basically stops a lot of ads across my network. So I have an ad blocker at the network level, which is really, really, really handy. Because all of a sudden, when I go anywhere else, I'll, I notice ads everywhere. And then I don't. So a pie hole, for those of you who like actually tinkering with stuff, is a Raspberry Pi, which you plug into your network. You download a thing called uh, Pi-hole uh, from uh, Pi-hole.org or whatever, and you just do Pi-hole up, and it installs this. You then configure a network to run its DNS through here. So in my case, I can, you can see here all the different blocks, domains on the block list, whatever. So I can block different things. I can also see where I've got different chatty apps. I can find out, for example, um, if something goes wrong. Um, uh, point of note, and from one of uh, my friends here, Lars Cora, if this goes down, expect a phone call from angry kids. So I have two of them. I'm now going to have to put a second one in. Uh, because failover DNS is actually a good thing to do it. My DNS is then running off against Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 over DNS over HTTPS. So this is really handy for me because I can then just, for example, uh, I block ads. So for example, when uh, my wife opened Vega, uh, all of a sudden she had gray boxes around everything. There was no ads on any device. So we see this quite well, and it works really well for us. This is a very handy thing. You may be thinking this will be a really good thing for kids to help block porn sites and whatever. Do not use this as a restriction method for your children's internet browsing and access. Why not? Yep. Good man, they will. Because what was the first thing I showed you? The VPN. Because once they figure out that thing, you're, this doesn't work. But if you're like, this is what someone says, can I use a pie hole, for example, to uh, have for kids and, and safety? And I said, you could, but it's very, very dangerous because what happens is they will find innovative ways around your systeming. The best thing to do with this type of thing is if you've got children, is educate them on how to use the internet safely, okay? Uh, screen some of their apps, make sure that they're kind of, if they're using apps and whatever, in your presence and so you can keep an eye on things. Like my son just got a, a new uh, smartphone for Christmas. We limited to, like he's got three numbers of the IceNet thing. He's got three numbers he can ring. We've set up, uh, for example, a uh, secure group uh, for within Skype for him so he can ring us when he gets home, this type of thing. So it's just so when he gets home, he rings us and lets us know he's there. It's like, great. And recently, he kind of, uh, he opened up Google, and it just had an automatic thing for Bran y Olgor, which is a, a town very near us. And so he read about this fire and got very upset that our house might be on fire. And I said, OK, son, so what happened here is there's news on the internet, OK? It's going to be written for adults, and it's going to be written and to be informative, not to try and scare you. So some of the stuff may not be for you. If you're worried about it, come and talk to us first. We'll explain what went wrong so you don't have to get worried about it, OK? I know he's going to find stuff on the internet. I know this for a fact. What I can do is prepare him and also make sure he can find his way safely through the internet. Because I don't want him saying, the internet is bad, don't use it. Because, you know, it's like saying, don't smoke kids because it's bad for you. And then all the cool kids are doing it and you're like, done. Okay? So I want to make sure that he's done this. So don't use a pie hole as your single point of failure for kind of monitoring children or whatever. So we talk about some things like malware, for example, and how to do good security practices of. Uh, I, one of the things I want to show you here is just as an example of Petya when it was running, um, or WannaCry, decrypt, uh, the WannaCry. So, any of you actually see how WannaCry worked? So this is a, this is a demonstration of WannaCry um, working on two VMs. They're both connected on the same network, and nothing is going to happen on the second one for a little bit. The first one is going to take about, uh, I think, in less than about 60 seconds to um, get uh, uh, encrypted. There she goes. And you can see here now it starts counting down and, and does all the things. You can't do much about it. Over here, you'll still see there's nothing happening. 
okay? But they're actually on the same network. So it's two VMs, so it's quite a little bit slower than average things. But all of a sudden, uh, it takes a little bit of time, they'll skip forward and all of a sudden, you'll start seeing this and doing the exact same thing. The disk here will start kind of uh, going a bit mental as they'll start encrypting. So what this was doing was basically a, uh, the SMB v1 exploit out of Shadow Brokers, and it was wormed. Normally, what we haven't seen a worm in a long time because, you know, uh, the concept of experience comes back that if you ask people about what is an internet worm, they don't know what it is. Because, but if you talk to like some of the older crowd, they would tell you things straight away about Slammer, Melissa, and all these type of things. Okay, so when WannaCry came, um, it was quite a, not new, but it was just a kind of, ah, crap, they combined an old technique with a new technique, and we've now got a better technique. So you can see straight away something just happened here, okay? So this is now automatically started putting on here and has been infected because it just does the SMBV1 exploit. It has now gone automatically to the next machine, and it will start encrypting as well. So the thing to keep yourself away from this is a good, decent antivirus, okay? I have seen people turn off AV on their computers because they think it slows them down. Ransomware will slow you down quicker, okay? And with that in mind, how many of you do backups? Okay, how many of you have checked the said backups? Because the backups always work, the restorers fails. That's what it is. Now, one of my favorite stories to describe is my wife. Um, she is a fantastic foil in all my talks. And she knows about this. She, I run by all the stories by her first because I don't want her getting upset when she maybe comes across the video. Um, but I said to her, I said, like, you know, um, one of the, the pictures disk died. The whole hard disk just ate itself. And she goes, shit, what the hell happened there? And I says, oh, the disk just died. She goes, does that mean all the wedding photos, the baby photos, everything's gone? I said, yep. She goes, vacation photos gone? Yep. She goes, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to wait an hour and it'll download from the cloud. Why the fuck didn't you lead with that first? <laughs> I said, because you wouldn't get to know how awesome I was. <laughs> so number, security tip number two, never turn down an expression to look how good you are at doing something. Okay, make sure you have a decent AV. Don't have to have two AVs running because they do slow down machines. But do, do not turn off the uh, thing. If you have a uh, uh, defender or whatever, turn it on. I use also VMs for doing certain things. So I have, I have VMs for, uh, for example, risky stuff, where I need to open an attachment to see what it's doing. Uh, if I don't trust something, if I want to do uh, have a look at things like that. I also have, I have a separate VM for doing, uh, for example, uh, what I would call less permissive work, uh, where I need to write some code that I don't know how it's going to interact with an OS. I don't, I don't want it to ruin my own, my own machine. So I don't write a lot of stuff on my home desktop. I will use VMs, and I will throw them away. Or I'll cold storage them if I need to. So use different VMs to isolate yourself out if you're going to do some risky work. Don't be doing it on a home machine, et cetera, where you might end up having a problem, OK? The last one kind of major one is you should be doing uh, file level security or actual disk, disk encryption for yourself. And one of the reasons for this is if you're not using disk encryption, what happens if uh, your, disk, your computer is stolen, whatever, all the data comes off it? And this is just an example here of how to break into a machine. So this is one of my uh, dev laptops. Um, and what I'm going to do here is you're going to see here I'm going to try and log in as a user, and I can't, OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reboot the machine. I'm going to plug in the USB first here. And I'm going to just plug it in. And I'm going to reboot the machine. And through the magic of video editing, it's going to look really fast. And I'm going to use Conboot. And what Conboot does is it allow it. It's uh, sorry about the zooming in and out. It was actually a webcam that was sitting in front of this because you can't really record this. Um, what it does, it, it, it this in this case, it brings up a um, the sticky key exploit, which is where you replace command uh, the uh, accessibility keyboard with the command.exe, which runs as, with admin prompt uh, admin key. So I'm now going to add a new user to the local machine. Okay, all right, with a pass one two three four exclamation mark. And the thing is, I'm also going to add them as a local administrator, because local admin would have privileges, et cetera, OK? OK? Now, on the, uh, this is available for both the Windows and Mac. With Mac, you just press Enter to log in. It rewrites the commands, and it just says Enter. With Windows, with Windows 8, with Windows 7, you could press Enter. With Windows 10, uh, 8 and 10, you have to use the CKT exploit. So as I, here, I'm going to reboot again. All right? You'll notice there's three users on the side. OK, restart again. Very fast login. There we go. See, it's an SSD. Um, so you see now I've got a little new demo user. OK. <coughs> so 
So pass one, two, three, four, enter. And Windows goes, hi. I'm happy you're here. <laughs> it's like, so am I. My demo worked. <laughs> but this is just an example. Now, Conboot, you're thinking, oh my god, this is, must be revolutionary tech. It's 15 bucks. Buy it, and you can install it in any USB, and off you go. All right? And what it's done, it's designed as a password recovery tool. If you've lost your password, and you get access to a machine. This is just an example. This exploit, what they've done is they've just weaponized an exploit that's been known for years on how to do things. If you actually get lost into a VM, for example, what you can do is re reboot the VM, log in using the kind of um, the Windows Restore tools, uh, copy over command.exe onto the, um, the taskbar, and all of a sudden you're kind of done, and you just then reboot, and you can add a new user, et cetera, and get yourself in. Now, the thing with this is, if I had been using BitLocker on the machine, the machine would notice something was gone wrong because I would have done something with the bias or done something with a boot, lo boot login. And it would have said, there is a disconnect between what I'm expecting the boot uh, sequence to look like and the actual disk encryption. So it would just go, uh -uh, get you off. Or it would even stop you and say, please enter your BitLocker key. Because you know that big, long thing you had to recover? Um, if you're using BitLocker on Windows and you have Windows 10, and you're worried about losing your BitLocker key, if you set it up against your uh, domain account, or your, which is your Windows account, it's stored in account.microsoft.com under BitLocker details, your actual BitLocker recovery key. Okay? This is really clever to put in, and it's a very thing. On Mac, do the app, do the app, uh, app locker as well. Right, I have one minute left. I'm going to close out, and I will, if you would, did I miss anything that you would like me to ask me about? I'll take that as a no. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's been a reasonable guide to security practices. Um, if there's any questions uh, towards the end of the talk, we'll take them now, or else you are free to go and grab a coffee. Thank you very much.